goodness. You're always looking so intimidating. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank all of y'all for being here. Um, while I do not like the circumstances in which we are here, I think it's very important uh, that you, one, hear from me, but also that we have a frank and honest conversation with regards to LSP and uh, everything that's surrounding our agency. But before I begin, uh, I, I think it's important for us to kind of say a few words for those that are experiencing some hardships as a re result of Hurricane Ida. Um, there's a lot of people impacted, a lot of our people in our agency that are impacted, and I need you to know that my heart goes out to you. I continue to lift you up in prayer, but most importantly, I need you to know that you're not in this by yourself. Uh, we're right alongside you. Um, we're going to do everything we can to ensure that you have a safe recovery and a speedy return. As you can see, um, we continue to support our communities through a very difficult and demanding time by providing services and support with the recovery efforts. Um, it's important to note that over 150 troopers and DPS police, as well as DPS employees, have also been impacted by the storm. But although they are going through their own trials and tribulations, they remain steadfast in supporting our communities during this very difficult time. So I really want to let them know that all of you all are in my prayers, and we're right along a side of you doing what we can to help you. Upon assuming the role of superintendent of Louisiana State Police in October of 2020, I quickly realized that our agency faced some significant challenges. And although the events in question happened prior to my administration, I committed myself and my team to making significant changes that would vastly improve the service that we provide all of our citizens. But before I get into that, let me just start by saying that I do not condone any form of excessive force, nor will I to tolerate this type of behavior in my agency. The mission of our men and women is simple, is to serve our citizens and the visitors to our state with professionalism, with pride, and with compassion. And although this hasn't always happened in the past, I can assure you that I will continue to hold those that violate our rules, that violate the laws and the Constitution accountable for their actions and for their behavior. With that said, we continue to move our agency forward by implementing reform and changes to policies on a multiple different fronts. But before I speak of those changes, I would like to put a couple of things in context. Over the last decade, troopers have encountered over 5.7 million citizens through traffic stops, arrests, and motorist assist. During that time, troopers were involved in use of force incidents 0.052% of the time. Now, how, however, that does not change the fact that we've had some employees that have violated the trust of our citizens and the trust of their fellow co-workers. And when that occurs, 
is incumbent upon us as leaders of this agency to ensure that we do what's right to hold them accountable and responsible. Over the last several months, our agency has been questioned about handling the handling of certain incidents, policies, practices, and internal investigations. And while I share your concern, I awake each and every day with the sole purpose of ensuring that we improve our agency in every aspect, in every way. But as you can imagine, law enforcement is not an exact, exact science. There are processes for investigating and prosecuting criminal cases that we need to abide by under the Constitution, under the laws of the state, and the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights. And it's with that in mind that I discharge my duties. As previously mentioned, there are several incidents that we've received questions on. And unfortunately, several of them are currently under investigation, which precludes me from discussing them. However, I would like to speak about some of the most recent, especially the recent story involving Lieutenant John Clary. As many of you may know, earlier this year, my agency personnel discovered that the video evidence relative to Mr. Ronald Green, recorded by Lieutenant Clary's Body One camera, was not submitted to the District Attorney's Office with the original case file. It was through our personnel's discovery that we learned of this. In this case, Lieutenant Clary, in the case of Lieutenant Clary, the videos were logged and submitted to our evidence.com system the day of the incident. They were also previously provided to federal authorities and used in the disciplinary proceedings of Trooper York. It was again provided to federal investigators and to the district attorney's office in a supplemental report. But we didn't stop there. Immediately after learning of this, I authorized my internal affairs section to launch an administrative investigation into this matter. As a result of this investigation, we determined that Lieutenant Clary logged and submitted the videos in accordance with our policy. We also learned that multiple current and former employees participated in the initial investigation. We attempted to speak with the former employees, however, they refused our request. And I'll speak to that a little later as I talk about the process. We did, however, interview the current employees that, that participated in the initial investigation. Once the evidence was collected and the interviews conducted, we closed the administrative investigation with a finding of not sustained due to insufficient evidence to prove or disprove that Lieutenant Clary intentionally withheld the video evidence. No discipline was delivered as a result of this finding. So I'd like to kind of explain the difference of sustainment. Uh, when we're dealing with sustain and not sustain, we're looking for reasonable amount of evidence, whether it be tangible evidence and or statements that would lead us to a decision of sustaining him. This is not unfounded, and when we're dealing with unfounded, that means that there were no, there was no evidence to suggest that he in fact lied or did not lie or withheld evidence. In this particular instance, due to the evidence that was provided or the lack thereof of evidence that was provided, we could not say for sure whether or not Lieutenant Clary purposefully withheld evidence. So I need you all to know that. Some of these investigations are clear and possess physical evidence. When there is no physical evidence, we weigh heavily upon the statements and testimonies of those that we interview. When those statements differ, we must search for additional evidence if available. 
But if not, the investigation has to be terminated based upon a lack of evidence. Now, in the event that additional information and or evidence is presented, then we can reopen and, and follow up on that. But in this particular case, there was no additional information and or evidence available. As such, Lieutenant Clary was not sustained on any policy violations. As noted, there are various considerations when deciding on whether or not to investigate and what type of investigation that we must conduct. For instance, if we receive information that an employee violated policy and or committed an alleged criminal act, we must first determine if there is credible information and or evidence to move forward with an investigation. If an administrative investigation is warranted on a trooper for any reason, and during the review, criminal investigators then can pursue an investigation. However, if we determine that there are criminal violations, then the administrative investigation is immediately suspended and we move towards a criminal investigation. And only at the end of that criminal investigation will we reinstitute or reinitiate an administrative invest investigation. If credible information on a trooper is indicating possible criminal activity, then we move straight into a criminal investigation. A complaint within itself without any evidence any tangible evidence does not constitute a criminal act. As such, we, will, we may not move directly into a criminal investigation. However, if we find reasonable suspicion, then yes, we will. And again, that is all dependent upon the information and evidence that's presented. When the evidence and or information presented is not clear and we identify potential policy violations, we may elect as we did to move towards an administrative investigation. If during that investigation we ascertain reasonable suspicion that a criminal violation has taken place or was committed, then we'll move towards conducting a criminal investigation as advised. Also, our internal affairs investigators handle our administrative investigation. Our criminal investigative division personnel handles our criminal investigations. But our internal affairs investigators have the ability to use information gathered in a criminal case. However, the criminal investigation cannot use information learned in our administrative investigation. And this is because under administrative law guidelines, all employees are compelled to participate in administrative investigations. But they're not compelled to participate in criminal investigations. Failure to participate in an administrative investigation could result in several disciplinary measures taken, including an up to termination. But as you know, or may be aware, there are also challenges with conducting administrative and criminal investigations. For instance, when conducting an administrative investigation, we cannot compel former employees to come in and participate. As in this particular case, there were some former employees that refused to participate. Second, we're limited on the amount of time due to the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights on the amount of time we can take to conduct an investigation. Under this particular time frame, it was 60 days. So at the end of that 60 days, if we do not have the requisite amount of information, we can, depending upon circumstances, request an extension. And of course, the accused in this particular case would have to agree to that before we can be granted that amount of time. However, That's not always the case. 
But I would like to say, due to the work of the Police Training and De-Escalation Task Force headed by Senator Fields, um, this time frame has changed from 60 to 75 days. Uh, I think that provides us additional support in being able to conduct our investigations. But there are also some limitations in conducting criminal investigations, as we've discussed. The first is that the burden of proof falls directly square on the agency or the investigating body. The second challenge is that it lies with, the, with our inability to compel any witnesses and or accused to talk with us while we're conducting an investigation. And that's covered by the Constitution, as everybody knows. When there are instances in which there is no physical evidence, we have to rely upon the testimonies of those involved. This often leaves us with a disadvantage. All administrative investigations of troopers must be in line with Chapter 12 of the Louisiana State Police Commission rules, which is our governing authority. This process requires the department to balance the employee's criminal due process with the administrative investigative obligations. So I would like to speak to transparency for a moment. I know that we've received a lot of criticism and there's been a lot of heartburn with regards to our agency not releasing body-worn camera footage and or other evidence being requested. You know, it's an ongoing process with our agencies and other agencies, whether it be local, other state, and federal agencies, to determine the appropriate time to release videos and documents while protecting the integrity of the case and considering the due process of all involved. That's always at the forefront of our decision. Premature and unauthorized release of investigative evidence in non-adjudicated cases can jeopardize the constitutionally protected legal rights of the accused individuals, potentially preventing full accountability in these matters. Let's think about that for a second. Simply put, if we prematurely release evidence in a case involving an accused employee, whether it be a trooper or anyone else on a criminal matter or otherwise, it could impede our desire to really achieve the, the results and justice that we're trying to achieve. So that's always something that we consider when we're thinking about whether or not to release body-worn camera footage and otherwise. By releasing portions of the evidence by non-investigating outlets, it can also impact the jury pool and influencing due process. Like many of our friends in the media, I'll be the first to tell you, I would love nothing more than to release the evidence as soon as we can. I think it gives our citizens a sense of relief. It reassures them that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And it helps to communicate the facts of the case. But as previously mentioned, doing so could have unintentional consequences that could gravely impact the outcome of those cases. So hopefully, we're nearing a point with the other investigations that are ongoing involving our agency where we can provide you additional information that would offer that additional insight to the changes, to the case facts, and to the processes and developments. But ultimately, I need everybody to understand that the officers who are subject to these investigations are afforded due process and deserve no more, no less than the involved people in any other type case. And we're going to own that. I must say that when any incident involves our own personnel, there may or may not be administrative or criminal violations related to that incident. But I need everyone to understand, regardless of that, 
you have my commitment that I am going to do everything possible to hold them accountable for their actions and for their behavior. I will not compromise on that. So I'd like to take a little time to discuss some of the changes that we've taken in our agency. Um, we've made some significant changes, starting with our command team. Uh, I thought it was very important, not just with our command team, but throughout our agency, for us to really look at and emulate our communities in which we serve. We have a very diverse state, and that diversity for me means value added. Anytime we bring together people from different cultures, different backgrounds, different sections of life, then that brings the opportunity for both of them or all of them to learn more information. And that's the way I'm pursuing with leading my department. Diversity is value added. It's not a subtra subtraction. It's not a giveaway. It's value added. We all grow as a result of someone else that comes into our lives. Now, it's not always the case, and I understand that. But I will not accept anything less. I've been all across the state. I've served through the military in other parts of the country and in other parts of the world. In every instance that I have come across someone from any other culture, I've gained, I've learned, I was made better. And I truly believe that if we all embrace that sense of diversity, we will all be better for it. So with that, we've made some other significant changes. As you can see, I've made my command team more diverse. I continue to work towards making my department more diverse. And it's not to say that one demographic is better than the other. I think all of us together, as I mentioned, become better. I'll start with our policies. We've made some significant changes with our policies and with the help of others in our communities and leadership. You know, with the assistance of our police training, screening, and de-escalation task force, uh, we've implemented a duty to intervene policy. Now every officer, every trooper has the duty to intervene. There is no excuse. When safe to do so, you will intervene or you'll be held accountable. We've enhanced accountability in the body-worn camera policy. We now mandate a specific amount of body-worn camera footage that will be reviewed by supervisors over a certain period of time. Every quarter, our immediate supervisors will review their body worn, their employees' body worn camera footage. We've expanded the use of force policy, including a ban on chokeholds, a ban on the use of impact weapons to the head or neck area, and, a mandate, and mandated that all of our troopers and DPS officers carry less than lethal weapons. And that's important because we do not live in society where the gun should be your first tool to be used. There are additional tools, less than lethal tools, that we can use to get the job done. But we also understand that there are situations that may call for us to use lethal force in the defense of others or ourselves. We understand that we're prepared to do that. But I also want to make sure that if those other instances involve us using less than lethal force to accomplish the same goal and keep everybody safe, then that's what we will do. In the form of training, we've mandated implicit bias training for all personnel. That's very important for me. And as I mentioned before, I've gone across the state, I've gone across the nation, and we're different. And as people, we all carry biases. 
whether we admit it or not, we all carry a bias about something. It may be a bias about sports. It may be a bias about wrestling. It may be a bias about other cultures, but we all carry biases. I think it's very important for us to speak to those biases, understand the perception of those biases, and as we do so, then what that does for us is that helps us and gives us additional information when we encounter people that do not look like us, talk like us, or act like us. That can be someone with an emotional uh, challenge or a mental health condition. So we continue to build by bringing that to the forefront. And I think by understanding the implicit biases that we're all better and we're all more informed as such, we can achieve a better outcome to all of our situations and in our encounters. As I mentioned before, we created a duty to intervene policy, but we did not stop there. We're creating training that also supports that duty to intervene policy. By doing that and creating that training, that gives all of our personnel additional tools to use when we see someone who may be under stress. As I mentioned before, many of our employees are undergoing the same stress, the same issues that our citizens are dealing with Hurricane Ida. And as we well know, that brings on additional stress to us. It's important for our coworkers and their coworkers to recognize that and to have that empowerment and the ability to step in when that stress level may get to a point where it now starts to impact the citizens of the state and or our employees. And that's what this training does. It gives us an additional tool so that we can stop any potential situations from happening like we've experienced several years ago. Rank doesn't matter. Status does not matter. Everybody has a responsibility to ensure that we all go home safely at night. We're also developing a de-escalation training. You know, as we begin to pursue best practices across the nation, there are several, several uh, de-escalation training programs that we came across that we feel that would really assist us in reducing some of the use of force incidents that we've been involved in. And by developing this training, I think it gives us, again, another tool, another force multiplier to ensure that we get the best results out of every encounter. You know, we're here for public safety. Sometimes that means training, it means education, sometimes it means enforcement. But when we take enforcement, it's important for us to understand that it does not mean that we need to go to the 10th degree. By instituting that de-escalation training that gives us an opportunity to approach every situation and get the best outcome. But again, we haven't stopped there. So on the operational front, we've created a force investigative unit to assist us in investigating officer-involved officer shootings and in custody death. And again, this is important because during those significant events, oftentimes that's when we lose the confidence of our citizens when there is either the perception or the reality of an investigation not being properly handled. By creating this unit, we know that it will be based off of national best practices. Those that will be participating on that specialized unit will receive the best training and they will be considered subject matter experts. That ensures us as an agency as well as the community that you're going to get the best result from that particular um, investigation. But they're also this program and this practice is used by many of the agencies that have undergone federal review. So we know it's a proven practice. And by having that specialized unit reporting directly to the command staff, 
you lack the normal challenges, red tape, and as some people would see, interference that you typically get from other investigative bodies. So me as the agency head, I'm going to get directly briefed on any and all of those significant investigations. And that gives me the opportunity to make an unfiltered but yet informed decision on those very serious situations. And it's our intent and our hope that by doing so, that begins to build that trust in our communities. Now, while that's important, I think one of the things that we have lacked for many years has been technology. When we talk about accountability, you know, it's very difficult to hold someone accountable when you have disparate systems that do not communicate and talk. Whether it gives a bad actor an out or 